one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. And the, person, and the personality given some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the training in the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking in the truth of love, let us grow in every way into him who is head. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Ephesians 4, 1 through 7 and 11 through 16. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, these, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to the another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the, by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another the ability, ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these were, are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as a body is one and has many members and all the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts of yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on these parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our, unpres and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians 12. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. 
Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by charging by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by faith, by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you, leader, given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Romans 12, 1 through 8. It's no doubt that Scripture has a lot to say about what our role and our function is as a church body. There's no doubt in my mind that Scripture is crystal clear of a few things concerning spiritual gifts. One is that they're varied. There's many. It's as diverse as you guys are. And y'all are a pretty diverse crowd. But isn't that how God is? Doesn't He find beauty in the unique details of our individuality? And His grace works the same way. You know, this last week we started a study on spiritual gifts, and today we're going to do the second part of our intro into the study. But what I want to say now, to set the table, and I couldn't set it any better than these ladies did just a minute ago, is this. You have purpose. Let that settle. Let that settle on you. You have have purpose. If you got your Bibles this morning, I hope you do. Turn with me to the, uh, the epistle or the letter or the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, we're going to look at chapter 4. 1 Peter, chapter 4. I want to thank the Taggart family for sponsoring this OU Cup. I'm going to turn it around so I can drink it and y'all can still see that symbol. The last gift you'll ever get. It's a good one to go out on, Linda. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to look at a few verses today, but in particular... I want to look at verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Once you have your place, if your body is able and you are willing, please stand in the honor of reading God's Word. As each one received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray now that this word wash us. Father, the word that was spoken this morning from the ladies, God, the word that was read just now, Father, the word that was read in our small groups during Sunday school, God, I pray that it washes over us with the intention of changing who we are and what we do. 
Father, I pray that right now your truth would speak boldly. And it would not be about a pastor or a preacher or musicians, or it would not be about, God, who the deacons are. Or it would not be about who the prominent families in the church are. It would not be about, God, our possessions or our things, but rather it would all be about Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the salvation that we have in him by grace through faith and faith alone. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. So, guys, I am so stinking excited. I don't know can I, if I can say stinking, but I'm really, really excited about what God has got for us in his word and where he has us, uh, where he's had us in the last couple weeks. I don't know about you, but if you're like me, it seems like this Christian life is kind of like just an adventure, a journey. We wake up, we go to work, we go wherever we go. Sometimes we do good, sometimes we do bad. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations we didn't think we were going to end up in. Sometimes we, we end up seeing people we never thought we'd see. Sometimes we go places we never thought we'd go. I mean, shoot, a couple months, three, four, I don't know, six months ago, Jerry and I was in stinking Turkey. But what I do know is that regardless of where our adventure takes us, we serve a God who has equipped us and given us purpose for that moment that we're in, including this one. And so why am I excited about spiritual gifts? Because I think that it is the most untapped resource of power and change that a Christian has inside of the Holy Spirit that indwells them. Now, if you're sitting in here in the sanctuary this morning, statistics show us that there are probably 44% of those who profess Christ that actually have a real heart change. That leaves 56% of people that profess Christ but have no fruit of change in their life. And so if what I say to you this morning isn't registering or isn't clicking with you, then I want you to begin to stop asking the gift question and begin to ask the question of, am I in Christ? Do I know Christ as my personal Lord and Savior? Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Because when I stand before God, and I will, as much as it saddens me, I want to see my son grow up, and I want to see grandchildren, and I want to see all that stuff. I want to see this church build new buildings because we can't hold the people in here. But before any of that, when I stand before the Lord, I'm going to be accountable not for what I did with the resources I've had, not with what I established on my earthly kingdom, not with anything besides what I did with the faith that God has given me in his son, Jesus Christ. Was Christ my Lord? Or was I my Lord? And I stand in confidence today that I can look and, and in confidence say that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Now, from that point forward, we still got to do something with the rest of this life we're living. Otherwise, he'd just take us up. Like, beam me up, Scotty. I'm saved. I'm ready. Let's go. But for some reason, he left me breathing. He left me here. Why? Let's do something. If you have anyone in your family or in your close circle who, if they died right now, stood a chance of possibly spending eternity separated from God. If you have someone in your family or your close circle that is lost, I want you to stand. This is why we're here. This is why we're here. For your loved ones, for your circle, and for the gospel. Have a seat. Today, I want to do a very simple Bible study, uh, and we're going to do it quick. Um, we will do it quick in, because we got an awesome way we're going to end the service. Um, we got Gene Simmons coming. No, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm really trying to filter my thoughts. But I want to do a Bible study today because sometimes we have a way as Christians of just complicating things. Now, you may, you may not feel this way. But when I first truly gave my life to Christ, I mean, granted, I was raised in the church ever since my father got saved. I was about 11 years old. 
And so I saw church. I knew church words. I knew how to answer questions. I was a competitive kid, so I wanted to beat everybody at Bible study drills. I wanted to do all that kind of stuff. So I had a lot of head knowledge, but I had zero heart knowledge of who Christ was. And as life went and as my life progressed, I hit a point about six, seven years ago where I finally placed Jesus Christ not just as an accessory to my life, but as complete Lord of all that I am. And when I did that, the first brick wall I hit was trying to get into God's Word because I was intimidated by it. And I'm just speaking honest. I'm just saying what you're thinking. I was intimidated by it. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how to do it. People would tell me, study the Bible, study the Bible, go home and read your Bible. And I thought, well, I mean, that sounds good. But once I finally get home and I'm holding this book in my hand, I'm like, what do I do? How do I do this? And if it wasn't for men who were older in the faith, not older necessarily in age, but older in faith, that came alongside me and said, listen, this is how we study God's Word. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be able to accomplish and know the truths of God's Word that I do now. And So what I want to do is just equip you with a very simple tool in studying God's Word. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these two verses, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and we're going to take them piece by piece, and we're going to see how they relate to the idea of spiritual gifts. And what do they tell us about spiritual gifts? What do these two verses reveal to us? What are some observations that I can make concerning spiritual gifts in this passage? So let's start. Verse 10. As each has received a gift. Stop. The observation that I want to make first on this text is I believe every single born-again believer in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has been given gifts, if not a gift. You have been given at least one gift. How do I know that? Because Peter said, as each one. He didn't say just as the leaders in the church. He didn't say just as the deacons or the Sunday school teachers or, um, you know, the 65 and older. or, Or he didn't say not. He said, as each one has been given a gift. So what that tells me is that each one of you in this crowd who has confessed Jesus Christ as Lord has been equipped with a gift. You have been given a gift. I mean, think about that. What untapped resource is in your possession in your spirit right now? What is available to you right now that is meant for service of the body? And the first truth I want you to know is that every single person in God has a gift. Let's continue reading. He says, as each has received a gift. Okay, that last part, received a gift. What can I observe from that? Whatever I have that God uses in me. Whatever, whatever it is, call it the call it whatever you want. Whatever God uses in me was given to me. It was given to me. It wasn't mine. It was a gift. He says, he says, as each one has received a gift, use it for what? To serve. Use it to serve one another. Hey, the next observation I have from this text is that gifts were meant to use. It was meant to use. It wasn't meant to put in the attic. It wasn't meant to be left unexplored, uninvestigated, and ill-informed about. It was meant to be identified, to be nurtured, to be developed, to be investigated, to turn over rocks, and then to take it and employ it and use it. The gift was meant to be used. Each one of us that have a gift, we have to acknowledge that that which we have has been given to us. Therefore, it's not ours. It's been given to us. And the intended purpose of it is to be used. Begs the question, what are you using? What are you using? 
Is it a talent that's fueled by your own ability? Or is it a gift that's fueled by God's ability? As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another. I want to recap last what we talked about last week. I love this one another thing. Because this one another thing is church. This one another thing we're talking about is real church. It ain't the country club, uh, my last name versus your last name, my pocket ver- book versus your pocketbook. Uh, you know, uh, I know my family had an unplanned pregnancy, but we swept it under the rug. But look at this drug addict over here. I ain't talking about that kind of church. I'm talking about the church that's one another, that's together. The gift was meant to use for that. And you know what's important about that? Last week, we talked about the Apostle Paul. He wrote, uh, he wrote to the church at Rome. And if you remember, it was in Romans chapter 1, if you want to look at it later, Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And, and Paul said this, I long to see you, brothers, so that I may impart to you some gift to strengthen you. And if you remember, last week when we started this study, I told you a more foundational problem than identifying a spiritual gift lays in the fact of you waking up and having a desire to serve. You can be gifted all day long, but when you wake up, if your desire is not to serve one another, what good is that gift? And practically, what does that look like? I shared with you, uh, I think, Sunday night or Wednesday night. For me, it looks like waking up. Some point in my morning, I've got a crazy morning because I've got wonderful, beautiful blessings of kids and lots of joy and happiness in my morning time. But if I get up before they get up, and I, and I, and I go to put my feet on the, on the floor, The way I start this process is I say, God, my desire today is to strengthen the faith of someone around me. That's what I long to do. That's my desire, God. I want to use whatever you've given me. Paul didn't say a specific gift, right? He said some gift. Whatever you've given me, God, my desire is to use it to strengthen the brothers and sisters you've put around me in my sphere of influence. So to me, a more foundational issue than identifying a gift or saying I have this gift or this gift or this gift is the issue of your willingness to want to serve your brother or sister next to you. Because that's the intended use, right? He said as each one is given a gift from God, use it to serve. And if our desire isn't to serve one another, what good is a gift? Now, I'm not stepping on anybody's toes because I'm up here on the stage. But if you're feeling something, realize it ain't me. And this applies to me. Because there's times I wake up and the first thought in my head is not, how can I serve my brother? Matter of fact, the first thought in my head is, how has my brother hurt me? Or better yet, how come I'm in this situation? Or how come I can't get out of this sin? Or how come this is happening? Or poor me? Or nothing ever goes my way? Or here we go again. I'm going to start behind the eight ball again. Not God. I long to serve my brothers and sisters around me. And check this out. If you can't say that, Start here. God, help me long to serve. Help me want to serve. Because if you can't get there, if that's not there, then anything else we go to in spiritual gifts isn't going to matter. Because at the base of it is our ability as a body of believers to strengthen the faith of one another to build up the body of Christ and ultimately to glorify Jesus Christ himself. We've got to want to serve. All right, let's keep reading. All right, so he says, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another 
as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now, the significance of me identifying that whatever I have of good has been given to me lies in the fact that I am to steward that thing. See, a steward is somebody who has been given something that's not theirs. And they're to manage that. You remember the parable of the talents? I feel like my, I feel like my shirt's crawling all over me. But in this parable, a master comes to three servants. And he gives each servant a portion of money. And one servant takes that portion and he goes and he doubles it. Right? He, he invests it in the Taylor family and he makes double his money. That's just wisdom if you guys want to invest in the Taylor family. But he doubles his money. The second servant takes what he has, and, and he doesn't double it, but he makes more money than he originally had. The third servant takes it, and he digs a hole in the ground, and he buries it. And when the master comes back, the first servant says, Look, master, I've given, I've take what you've given me, and I've doubled it. Here you go. Master is pleased. Second servant comes up and says, Here, master, I've taken what you've given me, and I have used it wisely, and now I have more to give you. And the master said, good job. And the third servant said, I was afraid. I was afraid. I didn't know the whole picture. I didn't know how you got this money in the first place. I didn't know if, if I was supposed to. I didn't know, so I buried it. I sat on it, and I sat on it, and I sat on it. And the master rebuked him. Why? Because he wasn't a good steward of what he had been given. Now let's step outside of the realm of spiritual gifts for a minute. Do you realize anything good comes from God? It's in James. Every good thing comes from the Father of lights. Anything good in your life comes from God. The significance of that is, first, it's not you. Secondly, whatever you've been given, you are to steward. You're to manage. You're to use wisely. I used to get so mad at responsible people. I really did. I just, I just cringed when I saw someone that just always did the right things, you know. And I thought, man, if I just had five more hours today, I could get this done, right? If I just had five more years, five more hours, five more seconds, whatever. And then, and then this wise man, which I wouldn't call him wise when he told me this, but this wise man looked at me and said, listen, son, I have the same 24 hours that you do. How about you use your 24 hours better? And it hit me. It's a gift. Which one of you are telling your heart to beat right now? Which one of you are telling your lungs to absorb oxygen and release carbon dioxide? Which one of you have given yourself life? Which one of you created life in a mother's womb for your children? It's all a gift. And we're called to be good stewards of it. Matter of fact, as men, that was our first job, right? Garden of Eden. God created everything. Told Adam, hey, Adam, see all this? It's yours. You know what your job is, Adam? Steward it. Take care of it. Tend to it. Use it wisely. Because it's a gift. Your money, you know what my pet peeve is? Not as a pastor. Uh, what, what, pet peeve, what is that about? What's a peeve? I don't know what that saying's about. You know what I don't like? Is I don't like, I, me and Cody, when we started tithing, it was about, I don't know, three years ago or so. Y'all might be really surprised, but we haven't always tithed. And then we used to tithe in the funky ways, you know. We'd be like, well, we're mad at so-and-so at the church, so we're just going to, you know, we're going to go buy popcorn for the whole city of Chickasha or whatever, you know. We we tithe in all these different but it wasn't tithe. It was just us, you know, using our money. Because then I learned what a tithe was. Not how much it was, but what the intended purpose was. And so we came to a point where we said, okay, God, we are going to use this money for you. We're going to give this to you. But you know how we were saying it? We were saying, God, this is your money. This money we pulled to the side, it's your money. And the whole time God's looking at me saying, son, this is all my money. What are you talking about? This is your money. This is all. Who gave you legs? Who gave you breath? This is all a gift. 
So how about you steward it in the way that I've called you to steward it and say, God, out of all the money you've given me, I'm going to take this portion and use it wisely by investing it in the local body I'm a covenant member of. Now, the same principle applies to context here with spiritual gifts. God's given you a gift. He's called you to use it. And better yet, he's called you to steward it. To steward it. To manage it. All right, let's read on. He says, as each one has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Again, that just tells me that I need to stop putting God's in boxes. I need, I need to stop saying this is how. This is, this is the limit of what God can do. I have no idea the dimensions of God's varied grace. And, I, and even though in the, in the upcoming weeks we are going to address every 20 of the spiritual gifts mentioned in Scripture, yes, we're going to talk about speaking in tongues. Yes, we're going to talk about the working of miracles. Yes, we're going to talk about all that. But let me go ahead and say this now. We are not limited to the 20 gifts. Why? Because God's grace is varied. It's varied. I truly believe my wife has the gift of empathy. I truly believe, I truly believe that some of you guys have been gifted with multiple gifts. Perfect example. I'm Marion, are you where are you at, Marion? Yeah, there you are. Why'd you move today? All right. I'm gonna I don't mean this to embarrass you, okay? And and uh, the Methodist church has got a complaint box you can put a dealing I'm playing listen Marion this morning served the leadership team our leadership team met at 8 30 in the morning the leaders of this church met at 8 30 in the morning in the fellowship hall and and Marion served us a beautiful breakfast and we prayed together we got in God's word together and you know what she did she served and then she sat back in the kitchen and she sat in a chair and she ate her breakfast quietly she cleaned up quietly and she disappeared. And what we said in the group is what Marion did this morning in the shadows of a church that none of y'all know about is no different or not any more or less important than what I'm doing right here in front of all you guys. She stewarded the varied gift of grace that God gave her in a way that strengthened her brothers and sisters, built up the body of Christ, and at the end of the day glorified her Savior Jesus. That's our goal. That's what we're after. You know why? Because I'm tired of just consuming. There's some people in this room, and it may be me, I don't know, who come just to eat. They come to get fed. They come to get that good sermon they need to get their blood going. And they just come and they eat. It's just like, it's just like we're just sloshed. Like, feed me, feed me. Give me my music style. Give me, give me my song selection. Give me, give me what I want. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And the whole time God is saying, you're missing it. You're missing it. This ain't even about you. What has God given you? To give, to use. I'm sorry, Cody. I didn't mean to get. I, I, it wasn't a soapbox. That's God's word, man. I, I ain't making this up. We're not called to consume, we're called to give. Right? Amen? All right. Let's keep reading. All right. If, no. Verse 10 As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, verse 11. Now, I want to bring out two quick points, and then I'm going to be done. I'm going to read all of verse 11, okay? Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And we're going to stop right there. Here's what I propose. The observation I make from this scripture is Peter is saying, whatever spiritual gift you have, whatever the various graces exist, they can fall into two groups, either speaking gifts or serving gifts, one of the two, okay? And so no matter what you do, whether you speak or you serve, speak as if an oracle of God. What does that mean? An oracle of God spoke with God's words. Now, he's not saying stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. What he's saying is if you open your mouth, make sure you're using the words the Spirit gives you. 
not your own words. And if you serve, like Marion served, make sure you served with the strength that God gives you, not your own strength. Does that make sense? Why? Because it's all about him. It's all about him. It ain't about how smart I am and how clever I am with my words. It ain't about my stamina and how much I can do in a week. It's the fact that God gives me strength. God gives me words. God gives me grace. And God gets the glory. That's what this is about. So he says, if you speak, speak as one as an oracle God. If you serve, serve with the strength that God supplies. And it's just, it's just a chin check. It's just a way to keep us humble. It's just a way to let us know it ain't you. It ain't your strength. It ain't your words. Because if it is, then it ain't a spiritual gift. It's just a talent. You just, you just happen to be talented at something. The difference here is that when we use the gifts God's given us, we're to use it by his power, his strength. His words. And then he says, in order that, anytime you see that, I want you to imagine an equal sign in Scripture. Anytime you see the words, in order that, just imagine an equal sign. All of that, everything previously stated, all the gifts that were given to each one, all the varied graces that were distributed out for everyone to steward, all the words that were spoken with the words of God, all the service that was done with the strength of God equals what? So that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Why? Because to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Me, I'm just a variable. Jesus Christ is the object of our praise. He's the giver of the grace. And he's the one who's worthy. He's the one that people should look at when they look at this church. When they see drug addicts come to Christ and clean up, I don't care if it's day one or day 100, they should give glory to Jesus Christ. When they see people come in off the street that haven't lived the life they had and people begin to surround them and build them up and strengthen them and edify them, the glory should go to Jesus Christ, not Grace Mount First Baptist Church. All of this is for the glory. Why? Because to him be the glory and the dominion and the power forever and ever. And notice Peter said, amen. You know what that means? Let it be. Let it be. As our invitation team comes forward, I want you to pay attention. Stay seated. I want you to pay attention. If you're lost here this morning, I want you to look at this. This picture right here.